Hello, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're in the book of 1 Peter, going verse by verse through the Bible for the fourth time in the last 30 plus years. We come today to 1 Peter chapter 1, and we will resume our study in verse number 23. So get your Bible, open it up to 1 Peter, if you can. The Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. And you can study the Bible at your pace, at your convenience, the whole Bible, verse by verse. Three complete series going through the Bible. Just click and listen to whatever book, whatever chapter, whatever section you want to listen to and follow along as I teach it verse by verse. That's what we're going to do today. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin reading in verse 22 of 1 Peter chapter 1. The word of God says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another, with a pure heart, fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. There's only one way to get saved from hell, and that's to hear the word of God and to accept it. No one ever gets saved unless they hear a straightforward message about Jesus being the only Savior, the only way for a sinner to avoid hell, the only way to receive eternal life. That is the message that must be proclaimed loud and clear with authority. No one ever gets saved unless someone tells them from the word of God that they must repent, they must turn away from their sin, and they must turn to Jesus and say, Lord, take control of my life and save me from hell. No one ever gets saved apart from the word of God. Therefore, no one will be saved unless Christians proclaim the word of God. That is our number one priority, our number one duty as Christians is to get out the Word of God. If God hasn't given you the ability to teach, to preach, if that's not your gift, you can pray for the Word of God to spread. You can pray for the Word of God to bear fruit. You can give to support ministers that get out the Word of God. There are lots of things you can do. But whatever you do, do something. That is our top priority. Right before Jesus ascended into heaven, he gave this command. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. The gospel is the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, preach it to every single creature. Everyone. That's what Jesus commanded us to do. And it's not just preachers. It's all Christians. Not everyone is called to preach. I get that. Not everyone is called to teach. But every single Christian on the face of the earth is, is called to, at the very least, support those who are called to preach and teach. To support them through their offerings and through their prayers. Because if they don't, then the job is not going to get done. If we don't do our part, all of us, then we are failing Jesus. We are disobeying the Great Commission. If we don't all do our job, we are failing Jesus. If somebody is called to preach and somebody is gifted to teach, but they hold back on the truth because they don't want to offend anyone, they're not doing their job. 
If someone is preaching the pure word of God and is not holding back, but is proclaiming the true gospel of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ and is calling sin, sin. But Christians who know that that's true and don't support, they're not doing their job. See, these are things that are taught in Scripture. When the Bible is taught clearly, the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God and burns it into the souls of the unsaved. They may accept Jesus. They may choose to reject Jesus. But one thing is certain. They will not forget the mark the Holy Spirit put on their soul when they heard the Word of God. But you know why in many modern evangelical churches no one ever gets saved Many of you know what I'm talking about. No one ever gets saved. It's because it's just entertainment. Sermons are designed to draw attention to the preacher and his great intellect. Cute little stories. Whatever the case might be. Soft-spoken messages. Soft-spoken messengers that watered down the world. Nobody is ever offended. Nobody is ever rubbed the wrong way. Nobody is ever blessed either. They might be entertained. But that's why people don't get saved. I remember one time, I remember one time I, I was asked, this was you know probably 20 years ago, I was asked to preach in a church, a well-established evangelical church and I at the time I was a part of that denomination I was just filling in for different preachers and stuff like that which I love to do but I went to this church and I preached the word of God I just did a verse by verse like I always do and I mentioned this in the past out of I don't know 120 130 people whatever how many of that were there one person shook my hand. Everybody was offended except for one little old lady who was about 80. She didn't just shake my hand. She ran up to me and grabbed my hand. She couldn't wait to get to me. And she was, oh man, it was just such a great message. That's the kind of message that we used to hear all the time back 40, 50, 60 years ago when we first started this church. See what I mean? So no one gets saved and no one gets rubbed the wrong way. And those are not the type of churches and preachers that should be supported. You are throwing your money down the drain. That's the Lord's money. It should be given with, it should be given with the idea of the great commission in mind. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, the word of God, pure and simple. Verse 24. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. Someone says, why do I need Jesus? Someone says, why do I have to get saved? Why, why do I have to prepare for eternity? Why should I care about those things? Because you're going to die. You may look pretty good right now. You may feel pretty good right now. But everyone dies. And it's not going to be fun. We exist forever. Because we have an immortal soul. But we're going to die. Which means that we will exist forever someplace other than here. And there are only two places, heaven and hell. People say, I don't have time to worry about stuff like that. I don't have time to think about stuff like that. I got shopping to do. I don't have time to worry things about like that because there's a ball game on. I don't have time to worry about stuff like that. I don't have time to think about heaven and hell because I'm watching my favorite television show. 
I'm going to a concert. Well then, mister, don't expect anyone to feel sorry for you when you're burning in the lake of fire. Because you got exactly what you got coming. The Bible says, prepare to meet thy God. Prepare to meet thy God. Consequently, if someone doesn't make that a priority, then they have no one but themselves to blame for their eternal torment. You don't have time to prepare to meet thy God? Hmm. Carry on. Have a good eternity in hell. Because that's exactly where you're going. God says our physical life is like grass. Our physical life is like the flowers of the field. And both of those things don't last too long. Grass and, and flowers wither and die. And so do we. No matter how young you are, you could wither and die before this day is over. Doesn't matter how healthy you are, you could wither and die before this day is done, before the sun sets. My mother told me this story that occurred before I was born. My grandmother, not that old, 61, 62. She was so happy after her doctor's visit. She called my mother, all excited, reporting to my mother that she didn't have cancer after all. She was so excited about that, so happy. She had it made. Her future was bright. But that was the last time my mother spoke to her because that evening she died of a stroke. The Bible says the grass withers, the flowers fall, and people die, sometimes unexpectedly, and sometimes expectedly, but more often than not, unexpectedly. In fact, most people who die today and there will be 100,000 people across the world who will die today. Most of them had no idea that this was their last day on earth. That's why people need Jesus. That's why people need to get saved. That's why you need to repent and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior if you haven't done it yet. Each and every second we live is an eternal version of Russian roulette and people better be ready to go. Everyone better be ready to go. Just saying. Verse 24. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. In stark contrast to everything else, <clears throat> including man, the word of God stands forever. The word of God is the only reliable anchor for our soul that we have here on earth. What it says, you can believe. It was true 10,000 years ago. It will be true 10,000 years from today. What it says you must believe or you will surely perish in the flames of hell. There is no doubt about that. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. And when you wake up in hell... It's going to be too late. You're never getting out of there. It's permanent. It never ends. It's forever. Tether your soul to the Word of God, to what it says about Jesus Christ being the Savior. And then and only then will you be eternally safe. I am the best friend you have right now for telling you the truth. And if you are a Christian, 
and you are getting stirred by this message because you know it's true too. And it's stirring you to go out and tell some others about Christ or pray for, for people to receive Christ or help me get out the word of God with your prayers and financial support. Whatever the case, this that's the Holy Spirit working on all of us together. It's the power of God's word. It's the power of truth. And we're dealing with reality here. This is real stuff. This isn't tinsel. When it comes right down to it, the Word of God is the only thing that matters in this world today. You know that? While other things may be important, the Word of God is supremely important because if we don't build our life and our eternity upon what it says, ultimately nothing else will matter because it's all going to come crumbling down including our immortal souls in the lake of fire. The Bible says that the word of God stands forever, which means that God isn't going to change his mind. He hasn't made a mistake. He's not going to erase one single word, one single letter of the Bible and say, I got that wrong or I changed my mind. No, sir. He isn't going to change his mind. You are saved by doing what the Word of God says, namely repenting and receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and that will never change. God will never say, well, I've changed my mind. I'm going to save people a different way. God never calls for a special emergency meeting in heaven and says, I've got some bad news for all you Christians. I know you've probably enjoyed your time here, but your time is up because I've decided to change my word. My son, Jesus, is not the Savior anymore. All who trusted in him, get ready to leave. Pack your bags. You're getting kicked out of heaven. It's never going to happen. We are secure in Christ because the word of God is secure. It never changes. See why I devoted my life the last 30 plus years to teaching the whole counsel of God? Every word, every verse, every chapter of all 66 books? It's because it's chainless, changeless. It's because the only thing that tells you the truth. Chapter 2, Therefore, Laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisy and envy <clears throat> and all evil speaking. Evil behavior is one thing. And I'm not condoning it. It is bad. It is rotten. It is terrible. God despises it. And it shouldn't be done. But the fact is, we are all guilty of behaving badly. The good news is that God remembers we are dust. So he has devised a plan whereby our evil behavior, our sinful behavior can be forgiven. And that plan includes an honest admission of guilt, which is called confession. Evil behavior is one thing. But to follow up our evil behavior with deception and hypocrisy in an attempt to deny that there is evil behavior in our life, that is spiritually deadly. That will ensure that your soul is damned to hell. And this is why, and hear me, and hear me good. And I've said this before, but you know what? I don't care. Because there are immortal souls at stake. And with so much of modern evangelicalism, making up excuses for people for their sin, not calling it an excuse, calling it a reason, it's the same thing. You have a psychological problem. And that's why you... Listen to me. Those preachers are of the devil. If you don't proclaim the word of God boldly the way God gave it and instead you water down the word 
to make to sound intellectual, to sound sophisticated, to not rub people the wrong way. You are contributing to the damnation of their souls because they're not going to confess a sickness. You think they're going to confess a dysfunction? You think they're going to confess a behavior disorder? Why? They don't feel guilt. You've given them an excuse. And Jesus is just some savior up there, their Jesus, who will help you overcome that and live a better life so you can have contentment and fulfillment here on earth. <sighs> boy, oh boy. The word of God needs to be proclaimed. There are souls at stake. God will forgive any sin that is confessed. God will not forgive one single excuse, which is what deception and hypocrisy leads to. It leads to denial. It leads to denial of guilt, excuses for guilt. And mister, you can't be saved. You can't be saved. If you don't think you are 100% totally responsible for your sin and confessing it as that and receiving Christ because of the guilt of your sin that needs to be removed, you're not going to be saved. Accept no substitute because there is none. Except those that come from the devil who use worldly-minded preachers in our worldly-minded churches. Deceitful people are so foolish. <sighs> Hypocrites are so foolish. Who do they think they're fooling? Think about that. Who do you think you are fooling? You know, people aren't stupid. As a general rule, they see through hypocrisy and deceit very quickly. And if it continues for any length of time, the deceiver loses all credibility and becomes despised. And that's just with people. Am I right? You better believe it. And God, of course, sees a hypocrite, a deceitful person, immediately. In fact, he knows what they're going to say in their hypocrisy before a single word leaves their lips. Consequently, he says to Christians, rid yourself of these things. What things? Look at verse 1 again. Therefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisy and envy, and all evil speaking. Evil speaking refers to slander or being overly critical. Speaking of being overly critical, it's good for us to remember that none of us are good, at least as God defines goodness. None of us are. We've all done bad. Enough bad to deserve hell, according to God. So why be overly critical towards others? Rather than being overly critical, we should keep in mind that we also depend on God's mercy. Rather than being overly critical, we'd be better off praying for those who we don't think are what they should be. Now listen, if you've been watching me, you know I don't water down sin. I don't water down the Word of God. I don't water down that. We all sin. I sin. I, I try so hard to do what is right. I try so hard. I pray to behave the correct way, to do things the right way, to make the right decision. I pray so hard as many of you do also. And yet I know because of my own dullness, sometimes I blow it and, and I feel so lousy about that. And that's one thing. You know, even Christians who love God do that. And we feel horrible, so we confess it when we recognize it because we love Jesus. We don't accept it. We confess it. But one thing I've never done is water down the Word of God. 
to make you or anybody else happy. I've never done that. I'm not, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I'm not crazy. I got to stand before God someday. And that's the most hideous sin is when the word of God is watered down to make everybody feel comfortable because then everyone feels comfortable. No one is convicted. No one is felt, feels guilty. They all have a built-in excuse. No one repents then. And no one receives Jesus because they're hell-bound. They receive some phony Jesus that some wretch of a pastor or preacher says you're supposed to pray to receive so you can be fulfilled. That is the most hideous sin in the world, in my opinion, because it is damning souls to hell. It is giving them a false Jesus, a false gospel, a false Christianity. And the ramifications are that, of that are frightening. So, it's one thing to point out sin. It's another thing to be overly critical and do it with hypocrisy and do it with a superior attitude. That's wrong because we all sin. But you can't be too critical when it comes to pointing out false teachers who are responsible for the damnation of souls, especially when they're doing it under the cover of so-called Bible-believing Christianity. Some of you people know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of you don't. Some of you get upset at me for saying this, even though it's the truth. You won't get upset at those who do it, who are guilty of it, but you get upset at somebody for pointing it out. But some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because your walk with Jesus is close. You're connected and you know. So he says, therefore laying aside all malice and all guile, be honest, be straightforward. No guile, no phoniness, no pretension. Speak the word of God clearly. Don't try to impress anyone. No guile and hypocrisy and envy and all evil speaking. We'll look at verse 2 next time. Do want to remind you that the Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com and that you can study the Bible in its entirety from Genesis through Revelation using my audio Bible messages. And if you haven't gone there, I really encourage you to do it. You know what I encourage you to do? To go to the first book of the Bible, the first chapter, click, listen, beginning in Genesis 1, verse 1. I know there have been several people who have gone through the whole Bible with me. And I suggest you do that. Because it'll change your life. It will enhance your faith, your love for Jesus, your holiness. There's nothing like the Word of God. And we need the whole counsel of God so that we're not led astray. As long as we study the Word of God, we don't have to worry about being led, led astray. As long as we study the whole Word of God, we won't be led off on some rabbit trail. That's not true. And if the Word of God is a blessing to you, please remember that I'm not underwritten by large church or denomination, but I do depend on God's faithful remnant who love His Word and want to support this ministry. And help me get out the Word of God. The most important thing that we can do, right? The Great Commission. It's His last command to us before He ascended. You want to do that with me? Pray for this ministry. Click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and give us the Lord may lead. And you can go back. You can listen to 30 years of my archives at that website. I've never changed in how I approach the Word of God 
Until next time, so long, everyone.